31. Um, when I finish, if you can say, um, thanks be to God, after I say this is the word of the Lord, that would be great. And um, today's passage is right after the disciples of Jesus, Peter, James, and John came down the mountain uh, with him to back to the other disciples. So I'm going to begin in verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing, arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And when he answered, and he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And as it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out but by anything but prayer. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, it's a long journey from the back. Um, so my name is Luke. Um, if we haven't met, uh, Luke Clark. I'm one of the elders here. Um, I'm not a full-time guy. I actually work outside of doing being a pastor, uh, which I really love. Um, and I love being able to preach the word and share it with you. Um, and so if we haven't met, I, I would, I please, I ask you to come and meet me. Come and I, I will try to pursue, pursue you. But, uh, you know, we say that a lot here as pastors, and we do mean it. We want to meet you. We want to know you. So I encourage you to do that. Um, so, you know, uh, the songs that were just sung, the last two songs, really summarize what um, I'm hoping that we can walk away with today. Lord, I need you, and what a friend we have in Jesus, taking our prayers to him. You know, often, and, I, and what I hope that we walk away with today, my, my main point here, is that often our faith is weak and doubtful, it's full of doubt, but what faith looks like is that it's often imperfect, imperfect dependence upon the perfect one and communion through faith with, with the Father through prayer. So it's communion with God. That's what faith looks like, communion with God through prayer. So I hope that we can understand that and see it through this passage. So let me just pray one more time. And we'll get going. Dear Lord, I ask for your help. I ask for your teaching. I ask that you would speak to your church, your children, your sons and daughters, the saints here, that you would open up your word and bring clarity. 
the Holy Spirit would bring illumination, understanding, Father. And I pray that for those who don't know you, who don't have faith in you, that they too would see Christ. They would see the cross and they would put their faith in him and love you. Lord, I ask again for your help for me. I could depend upon you right now. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So you'll remember last week, Camden taught from the beginning of chapter 9, and that's when the transfiguration happens, when Jesus' his glory, his true self, his deity, his, who he is as God, is, was revealed. And Peter, James, and John were there, and they're in shock of it and amazed. Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament show up. It was a, really an amazing moment. But now we come to Jesus and the three disciples, and they're traveling back down the mountain. And as they come to the other disciples, the other nine, it's a chaotic situation, a chaotic scene. The other nine are surrounded by a crowd, surrounded by scribes. There's arguing going on. Some, there's a commotion. But we will see that in, in that chaotic moment that Jesus will show compassion, that even though there is much doubt and faithlessness in this moment, that Jesus will lead people to faith. He will show them what it means, what it looks like to have faith in him. And he will, along the way, challenge them to depend upon him. So, what's ahead? Well, we're going to walk through this passage. We're going to look at the verses. We're going to try to better understand it. And then I hope to close with two important exercises that will benefit our faith. It will help us in our faith. So let's just set the scene here. In verse 14, they come, and there's a great crowd surrounding the nine disciples, the other nine disciples. And this will help us to see what is going on, the feeling, the general feeling of what's happening. Um, they, we see that the crowd in verse 15 runs to Jesus. They, they realize after now, the disciples have been trying to cast out a demon. So, whoa, whoa, look, Jesus is coming over here. And so they run to him and greet him. And Mark says in verse 15, when they saw him, were greatly amazed. They were filled with amazement. Now, what, is it, what does it mean that they were greatly amazed? You know, is it just that they were excited to see Jesus? I think so, but I think there, there are two things that we can see here that are helpful for us. Um, the first is that uh, Jesus is the better Moses, and then the second is that this phrase, um, greatly amazed, helps us understand the situation a little bit better. So you remember, just at this first point, that Jesus is the better Moses. If you remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, Moses has just been given the second um, ta tablets with the commandments of God. Because the first time, Moses came down with the tablets, and he found the Israelites in sin, rejecting God, going their own way. But the second time, Moses comes down with new tablets of the, the, the covenant, the old covenant, to present them to the people of Israel. And as he comes... The people see him, and un Moses doesn't know this, but his face is shining bright. And the people recoil in fear and are afraid of him because his face is shining bright. You know, as we think about Jesus, this, we, we should be thinking, we should be looking back to that story. And this should remind us of that. And we're seeing a better Moses that as Jesus approaches, as his true self was seen, his deity, he comes down and people come to him with joy and amazement. In Hebrews chapter 12, 
we read a passage that helps us understand the new covenant and what it means as Christ is that new covenant. In chapter 12, verse 18, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. And then in verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now this isn't saying that the God of the Old Testament was all anger and wrath. It's just saying that we have come to Christ, who is the, the, the fulfillment, the, the representation of God's love and mercy. And that in, through him, we have life. And that we can come to him without fear. So Jesus is the better Moses. Let that encourage your faith, that you can come to Christ without fear. So the second, I think, helpful um, way to understand this phrase, greatly amazed, is to actually look at the word in the Greek, to try to understand, to, to look where it's used elsewhere. And I think it, it's getting across a general feeling of the crowd, this general chaos of what's going on, this stressful situation. So the Greek word for greatly amazed is ekthambeo. You got to say it with like a lisp, ekthambeo. Um, so what, what it means is amazement or to be astounded. So it's used four times in the New Testament. This is really interesting stuff, guys. This, this is interesting. Four times it's used in the New Testament. All four times are in the book of Mark, in the gospel of Mark. This is the first time, right here in chapter 9. And then the second time is in Mark 14, 33, which is where Jesus is in the garden of, Geth of Gethsemane. Another word you have to say with a lisp, <laughs> Gethsemane. And there, Christ, the word is translated into English, greatly distressed. This is that same word. He is greatly distressed. And why? Because he knows he's going to the cross. He will not turn from it, because that is his calling by the Father. But he knows what he will bear, the wrath of God for our sin. And so he is greatly distressed. And so as he prepared himself for the cross, he was greatly distressed. And so this word expresses great joy or pain or alarm. That's the other two times it's used in Mark in chapter 16. Is it gets, it's, 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 used, it's translated alarm. So the crowd is in joy because finally someone is here to do something. They've watched the nine disciples unable to cast out this demon. All nine of them have gone one after another to try to remove this demon from this young boy. And they, ha and they have not been able to. And so they see Jesus, the one whom the disciples follow, their leader. And they, they are filled with joy. But I think the word also gets at what the father echoes when he says in verse 23, if you can do anything, that there is a feeling in the crowd that We've seen the disciples not be able to cast out this demon. Can Jesus do it? Can Jesus do it? There's, there's a stress, there's a, a fear that can, is the Christ truly who he says he is? There's a lack of faith. Not only in the crowd, in the Father, but in the disciples as well. So, as we continue we see that Jesus asks the disciples what is going on? Why are they arguing with the scribes? You remember the scribes are the 
the keepers of the law. They, they, they're the fact checkers of the law. And so probably they're calling out the disciples, saying, you, 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 who you follow is not the Messiah. You have no power. We, we asked for a sign earlier, and you can't even heal this boy. You can't cast out this demon. And so they argue with the disciples. But in that moment, in verse 17, and someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. So someone pipes up, and it's the father of this boy. He says, I, I am the reason that this is all happening. I'm this is why this crowd is going crazy here, because of my son. I brought him to your disciples. And they were unable to heal the boy. And so we learn what's going on. We understand that this boy is demon-possessed. It seizes him at times. It throws him to the ground. It convulses him. His teeth grind. His mouth foams. He is mute and deaf at the same time, able to see everything that's happening, but not able to say anything or even hear anything. This really is an attack by Satan upon the image of God. All humanity is created in the image of God, and this is Satan's attempt to destroy the image of God when he, he uses a demon to possess someone, to throw them, to put them in pain. And so the father adds that this, all the disciples had tried to remove the spirit, but were unable. So why couldn't they cast out this demon? Why were they unable to do it? We know that in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 12, that Jesus gave them authority to um, preach the kingdom of Christ, to cast out demons, to heal the sick. But here in Mark 9, something changes, has changed. You know, wh what happened? What happened in between? Well, I think that they became self-dependent upon themselves. That they were becoming faithless. And that's what faithlessness looks like. Self-dependence upon ourselves and not upon Jesus Christ who calls us, who makes us his own. Self-dependence. Now he... When Jesus says in verse 12, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, verse 19, and he answered uh, the Father and the crowd, everyone, he says, O faithless generation. He is speaking to everyone here at this moment, but focusing on the disciples. They are still focused. The disciples are still thinking about the kingdom of the, the kingdom of God in an earthly way. They are hoping for a David-like kingdom in the Old Testament where they conquer the Romans, where they take over their country, where they are rulers, and where Christ is the king. They are looking for a physical kingdom, and they're missing the point. They're missing the point that Jesus is making when he says, I'm heading to the cross, so take up your cross, Deny yourself and follow me. Deny what you want, what you want to use me for, and follow me. Take up your cross and follow Christ. But let your faith be encouraged here. As we see the disciples and their faithlessness, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Over the time of their walk with Jesus, they trust him more. They seek him more. The ones who truly follow him, the 11. And we see them do wonderful things. as They follow the Lord and they deny themselves. They take up their cross and they follow him. The Lord is patient with us in our life. We think about our spiritual growth, our sanctification, the process that we're in. It, it, it is full of ups and downs, mountains, highs, and valley lows. And Jesus is gracious to us. And even now, when you hear the word preached to you, Christ is seeking 
to build you up in your faith, to encourage you, that you would seek him more, that you would depend upon him more. So, in verses uh, 20 through 27, we see a cry of weak faith. But the Lord is compassionate to this father. And Jesus asks, you know, how long has this been happening to the boy? Because as this, the father brings the boy to him, the boy convulses immediately. And because the demon is confronted with the God of the universe. And so he foams at the mouth. And Jesus asks, how long has this been happening? And the father says, since childhood. So this boy could be teenage, a teenager, could be in his early 20s. This has been happening a long time. So much pain and suffering on the boy's part, on the family's part, to see their son go through this and not being able to do anything. And this is where he says, where the father says in verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That, you know, when we hear that, we say, if you can do anything, we might laugh and say, come on, man, you know he can do something. We, we see in all the scripture, we know, right? We think we do. But what has this father seen? He's just seen nine of Jesus' disciples not be able to do anything, not being able to cast out this demon. So he says, if you can. And Jesus will show compassion. He will help this father. He will help this boy. But Jesus challenges this man's faith because he does have doubt. He does have doubt. So Jesus challenges him. He almost rebukes him. He says, if you can, if I can, of course I can. Anything is possible for one who believes. But do you believe? So the question is not, can Jesus cast the demon out? But will the father believe? Will this man believe? And that's true for us. Jesus is able to do anything, to heal us, to change our lives. But will we believe? Will we put our faith in him? In Matthew's gospel, his telling of this same story in Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20, Jesus says, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And that's why Jesus says here in our passage, in verse 25, I'm sorry, in... Um, in verse 23 of Mark 9, all things are possible for one who believes. So Jesus gives this illustration of the mustard seed. Do you know what, uh, how small a mustard seed is? You know how, remember how small it is? I do. I have this little uh, mustard seed here. Um, Nathan gave these to us, Nathan Singh, uh, during one of his sermons. I don't remember a thing he said that day. It would have been cool for me to like listen to his sermon. He probably had something really important to add to here, but I didn't do that. So, but we see, you can't even see it probably up here, right? I mean, so tiny. And so what Jesus is saying is to have faith as a mustard seed, so small. And what we learn is that a mustard seed, like most seeds, start out small but grow into something great and big. And so Jesus is saying, have faith in me, even small faith. Believe in me that I can. Be dependent upon me, even a little bit. And this is when the moment comes in verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out 
And literally, he says, I believe. Help my unbelief. He cries out to God, to Jesus. I believe in you, but help me. Help me in my unbelief. This is a a good prayer. This is a prayer to Jesus. He's asking for help in the midst of his faithlessness. He's asking that the Lord Jesus would help him. So maybe you haven't experienced anything like this, Father, having your own child possessed with a demon. But have you experienced pain, suffering, loss, confusion, fear, a reality of helplessness, and not being able to be in control of your life? I point you to Jesus. I point you to Christ who says, I will help you, but have faith in me. Believe in me. The Son of God, who is God, who became man for humanity's salvation from our suffering and our sin so that we could have communion with God, so that we could know and enjoy the Father and know and enjoy Jesus, our Creator. I I can't really ask you, do you want this? I tell you, you need this. Lord, I need you every hour. And cry out to God, I believe, help my unbelief. So after the Father cries out to Jesus, Jesus rids this demon from the boy forever. He casts it out. And the crowd thinks that this boy is dead. But he's not dead. We see almost resurrection language here. Where the crowd thinks that he is dead, but in verse 27, Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. But in verse 28, as this, the whole scene ends, the crowd disperses, the father and the boy are filled with joy and amazement and faith. Their, their, his small faith has grown and seen something big. Verse 28, And when he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So the disciples are able to be with Jesus alone, and they take the moment to try to understand, so what was going on there, Lord? And we've already spoken a lot on what that looked like, why they weren't able to. Because they were not depending upon Christ. But Jesus says, he adds, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. He's telling them that from the beginning, when you met this demon, this boy, you should have been praying to the Father, seeking the Father's help. They should have prayed to the, God, to, to the Father. Instead, they were depending upon themselves and had missed the source of their authority to cast out demons. It says Jesus told the disciples in the book of John, the Gospel of John, verse 15, I'm sorry, chapter 15. Jesus tells the disciples in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So Jesus is saying that without prayer, which prayer looks like dependence, you can't do anything. If you're not abiding in me, you won't you would never be able to cast this demon out, let alone do anything. So Jesus challenges them to put their faith in him. And we'll look more at this at the end. But in verses uh, 30 through 32, 
Jesus, for the second time, foretells his death and resurrection. There's three times in the book of Mark that Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. And it says, as they went on from there and passed through Galilee, he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And they did not understand the saying, but were afraid to ask him. We can't blame them for not understanding. They haven't fully gotten it yet, but they will. But we see that Jesus tells, foretells the gospel. That this is what the gospel is. That Jesus would be given over to the hands of men, falsely accused, that they would kill him, he would die on the cross, and that he would rise from the dead. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus gave himself for our sins and was delivered for our deliverance. We see as Jesus was handed over to men to be crucified, that he was actually handed over, delivered for our deliverance from sin, from ourselves, from our need to be self-reliant upon ourselves so that we can be reliant upon Christ. Without the cross, without Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead, we are hopeless. We could not depend on him because in our sinfulness, we will always go after what we want. We won't seek God. But through the cross, by the power of the cross, by Christ's death and resurrection for our sins, we can have communion with God and thereby have life and joy and the presence of God with us. So do you realize that you need rescuing? That's what that word means, deliverance, rescue. Do you know that you need to be rescued? Not only from this world, but from yourself. If we were left to ourselves, we wouldn't seek God. But God chose to rescue us through Jesus Christ and the cross. If we wish to have faith, the joy and the peace that come from it, we must start at the gospel and believe there first. We must believe in Christ and the gospel. And as Jesus said, a, the, the faith of a mustard seed, how small, putting our faith in the Lord. And it is, I don't want to say easy, but it is simple. Belief is simple. In Mark, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 9, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9 of Romans, Paul said, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Isn't that kind of what we worry about when we have faith? Uh, you know, I'm going to be put to shame. I'm, 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 I'll be found that it wasn't real and that I wasted my time, and the world will put me to shame. But Jesus is saying, the scripture is saying that you will not be put to shame because the Lord will prove himself to you. He will save us. He will redeem us through the gospel. So as we come to an end, I, just, I want us to look at two exercises that will help our faith, that will build up our faith. So you might be disappointed to hear these exercises. I don't have new and exciting ways to build up your faith. I have these cool, tried and true methods. Prayer and reading your Bible. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? Um, I'm not telling you anything new, hopefully, you know? 
These are simple. Prayer and hearing and reading the Scripture. You know, as you're hearing the Word of God right now, it is building up your faith. As you read the Scriptures and believe them, it is building up your faith. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on talking about the, the Scripture, but here at New King, we, we always try to reiter reiterate this, that through the Scriptures, through prayer, through other spiritual disciplines, we know God and our faith is built up and we grow and we become more like Christ. And that helps us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. But let's talk about prayer for a few moments. So remember that our faith is often weak and doubting, but faith looks like imperfect dependence upon the perfect one and communion with the Father through prayer. So let's try to understand this further, um, that um, our communion with God through prayer builds dependence upon him. So just two things to hopefully help us here. One, what is communion with God? And then dependence versus self-sufficiency. So first, what, is it, what does that mean, communion with God? Well, it's a term that's been used for a long time to describe our relationship with God. To compare what it means to be in Christ or what it, and what it means to have communion with God. So let me just just define what it means to be in Christ. We see this throughout the scripture that Paul says you are in Christ. And what he means there is that when we are in Christ by the gospel, belief in the gospel, that we have been given the righteousness of Christ and thereby we stand before the Lord, before God, justified. And that by that justification we are being sanctified. We are in process, growing, growing to one day be glorified, to be with the Lord and enjoy him forever. So that is what it means to be in Christ. Those are the benefits. Those are the realities of our salvation. And that cannot change. That cannot be taken from you. If you are in Christ, you have been justified. You are being sanctified. But our communion with God can be distorted. It can be chopped up as we see in the disciples, that our walk with the Lord can get distracted. We can become dependent upon ourselves. We go after our own way. We stop denying ourselves. And so our communion with God can be broken up. But it is easy to come back through faith and through dependence. And one other thing that communion with God means is that we pray to our Father. We say, Abba. We pray to our Father. Jesus, the first thing that he teaches about prayer, in Luke chapter 11, verse 2, he says, When you pray, pray, Father, hallowed be your name. He uses a very intimate and loving term, Father. He doesn't say, Lord, or master, king, creator, or as maybe in the Old Testament, what Abraham knew the Lord as, almighty God, all true things of our Lord and of God, our creator. But Luke says to use the term that Jesus used, Father, to pray to God and say, Father. So, let's look at what does it mean um, dependence versus self-sufficiency. So dependence, as we've seen, is, it, is trusting in Christ, having faith in him, leaning into him. But self-sufficiency, which is something that our culture, many us, I, value. We love self-sufficient people. We, we hold them up. We respect them. Most of the time, when I meet someone and I'm res I have respect for them or I'm impressed with them, it's because they're self-sufficient. I'm like, man, that guy's a good guy. I'd like to be like him, you know? Self-sufficient. You provide your own way. 
you've, you haven't let your, your past life or whatever circumstances you're in hold you back. You are self-sufficient. So our culture values that, and we do as well. But what Jesus says is that true faith, true growth, is not being self, more and more self-sufficient, uh, uh, self but dependent upon him. We are to be needy. We are to run to him. And this doesn't diminish hard work or being sufficient, self-sufficient, but it honors our need for Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 5. In verse 19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So the Son can do nothing of his own accord. Jesus was dependent upon the Father. Even Jesus, God himself, was dependent upon the Father. So we too must be dependent upon our Father. So building up our faith through prayer, it's not, it's not so much um, seeing the answers to prayer, seeking the answer. It is faith building to see God answer prayers. But what is more important is that we pray that the act of talking to God, seeking God, builds up our faith. It builds up our dependence upon him. And that is what's important. That's what Jesus was saying in verse 28, that you were not seeking me. You were not praying to me. You weren't praying to the Father. He wants dependence upon him. When I was in um, college, I had a really wonderful friend uh, who discipled me and encouraged me so much. He wrote a note in a, um, a journal, and he, he shared it with me. Um, but he shared this, this idea of the cru a, a crutch of faith. You, have you ever had someone uh, tell you, well, you know, I don't need that crutch that you have, faith. Uh, that crutch, you know, we all walk on a crutch if you break your leg, right? I, I don't need that. I, I'm, I'm fine. What do I need faith for? What do I need Jesus for? Well, in a sense, guys, this crutch of faith, it truly is a crutch because we need Jesus. We need him. We are in desperate need of him. And so, we all, like lame beggars who, cannot, who do not have a leg to stand on, we stand on grace. We stand on Christ. Stand out dependence upon him through prayer to know him. And we offer him to the world, no matter what. Be as other self-sufficient people, I'm, I'm, because every other self-sufficient -su person does not realize their need for Christ. And so we can share him with others. We can present to them hope. We can encourage them and point them to Jesus, that they place their faith in him, that they can have Christ, they can have a relationship with God, they can depend upon him in prayer. So I encourage you, brother or sister, to pray more, to not go into your own mind and try to figure something out on your own, but to seek God, to seek your Father, to bring to Him your trials, to bring to Him your worries and your fears, to depend upon Him in every situation. Let prayer be that tool, that, that help to you. So let me pray as we close. Father, we thank you that you gave Christ, that you gave yourself 
so that we could be brought to you in relationship, so that we could know our Father, and that you could change us through the gospel. Lord, I ask that you would work in our lives, that we would deny ourselves, that we would be less self-sufficient and more dependent upon you, Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.